Hi, everyone. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to our fireside chat with Ian Kane and John Deaton. We're super excited for our conversation today. I am Doug Maney. I am the chair of the Boston Blockchain Association. I'd like to thank our co-host, South Carolina Emerging Tech Association, uh, and its president, Dennis Basuliotis. Um, we're going to start with some intros here on the BBA. John, please. For people that don't know the Boston Blockchain Association, we have three pillars. One is around education, the second is around advocacy, and the third is building out the unique ecosystem of Boston and Massachusetts across New England, across the U.S., and globally. Thank you. There are three ways, to, there are multiple ways to get involved in the BBA, and we would encourage you all to reach out um, to the bostonblockchainassociation.com. You can join as a corporate member, as an individual member, and as a volunteer. Uh, the BBA is what I call a volunteer army, so we would love for you to reach out and get involved. Uh, as always, we'd like to thank our corporate members and sponsors. I'm not going to read through all of them, but we could not do these kinds of events, the programming and the depth uh, and the insights to our ecosystem uh, without these valuable partners so we thank you all for your continued participation and partnership. All right, so we're gonna jump right in um, uh, with, with intros. <clears throat> and I'm gonna start with Ian. Ian was born and raised in Massachusetts. He is a graduate of BC High and Boston College. He has an MBA from Duke University. He's the founder and chairman of Cubic Labs, an emerging blockchain and tech incubator for startups. Ian is also the president of the Quincy, Massachusetts City Council. Ian has recently received endorsements from Senator Cynthia Lummis and Jane Swift, the former governor of Massachusetts. Um, I asked people close to Ian to, to describe him and include some things that wouldn't be known to the public. Impressions from Ian's circle, and I quote, Ian is born and raised here. He's a grassroots guy, grew up in a democratic and Republican family. He's trusted, intellectually curious, a community builder who wants to give back, is collaborative and a coalition builder, has stayed true to his roots, has a vision and a plan, saw blockchain technologies as a vehicle to bring jobs to Quincy, has a strong track record with startups and emerging technologies. He understands state politics and the Democratic and Republican drivers and priorities. He bridges generations and gaps, is reasonable and adaptable, and he is, and I quote, he is a get shit done executive. Ian, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for having me. John Deaton. John is a graduate of Eastern Michigan University and graduated with the highest honors, a graduate of New England Law School. He is a major in the Marine Corps where he received the Meritorious Service Medal and the Navy Marine Corporate Commendation Medal. He's the founder of Deaton Law Firm and of Crypto Law. At Deaton Law, John focused on representing clients with asbestos-related diseases. John also founded Crypto Law when he took on the SEC and its treatment and actions against XRP and Ripple. He is also the author of an autobiography titled Food Stamp Warrior. I will share, the book is an incredible candid view of John's life and how he has fought through every obstacle presented to him. This is a theme throughout his childhood and adult life. John also has received notable endorsements and a large contribution from Ripple, its co-founder and its CEO, and two founding partners of Gemini, Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss. The same approach with John, impressions from his inner circle. John has a deep knowledge of blockchain and digital assets, has a clear vision of the related benefits and challenges. He is the hardest working person they know. When he takes on a challenge for a client, friend, or colleague, he owns it through completion. He stayed with his clients in the hospital when they needed him. He puts others' interest ahead of his own. He has a track record for sitting across the table with people that have strong differences of positions in the best interest of his family, clients, and colleagues. John doesn't need to do this, but he is driven to make an impact. He believes in term limits and accountability he comes across as a tough guy, but is very sensitive and caring. He is a family man and equally driven as a committed father. And again, John, those were all quotes from, from your, your group. Well, uh, again, I'd like to thank John also and really appreciate both of you joining. 
kind of following with our probably unorthodox uh, fireside chat today, but we appreciate it. Uh, thank very you for quickly, having me. Very quickly for everyone, this is not a debate. It will likely be an unconventional fireside chat. We want to get to know Ian and their priorities. The focus on the conversation is on their platforms, plans, and positions related to blockchain and digital asset technologies, policies, regulations, adoption, innovations, and our ecosystem. We'll do about 40 minutes with me, 15 minutes of a guest Q&A. So please submit your questions uh, with the link and we'll moderate with the candidates and we'll do a five minute close uh, with Ian and John. We will show the QR codes to be able to donate to Ian and John's campaigns. And we would ask you all to do so uh, if you can tonight. Uh, we will record this session tonight and we will share it in our weekly newsletter on Monday morning. Uh, and lastly, I do want to share with everyone, as we have included in our newsletter, uh, we also invited Senator Warren to do a similar session with us. Her team has declined um, as she is unavailable. So we're going to jump right into the questions. Uh, thank you both again. Ian, we're going to start with you in a two-parter. Um, how will you take your passion and success community building and your focus on the digital economy in Quincy and Massachusetts to the national stage? And what will that national engagement look like? Sure. Uh, well, thanks, Doug, again. Thanks to the BBA. Thanks to the South Carolina Emerging Tech Association and Dennis for hosting this tonight. It's a great opportunity to get in front of your crew. And this is a, a true full circle moment for me, um, you know, about five years ago or maybe even six uh, when I started getting involved in this space, it was through the BBA. It was with John Hargrave. It was with this community that uh, set me on the path that we're standing here today now exploring how to take someone out of the way who has been in the way of our progress uh, here in the Boston area, here in Massachusetts, and then, uh, you know, more broadly in the entire blockchain and digital asset space. So, you know, as you know, we started Cubic Labs in 2019 with the idea of spreading entrepreneurship and innovation south of Boston. It was uh, a program that was led by the Mass Tech Collaborative uh, that I found in 2020 that was uh, led and delivered by John Hargrave and Media Shower uh, that, that really started educating me on the benefits of blockchain and looking at how we could deploy blockchain projects in cities and towns in Massachusetts. And so we sort of marched forward over the next uh, you know, subsequent years looking at how can we um, build economy around this emerging technology? How can we you know, use Cubic Labs as a vehicle to support founders and startups and to create jobs that will benefit uh, residents of the Massachusetts and its economy uh, more broadly? So you know, we, we've taken a very, uh, like, I guess, sort of in business and in politics, we take a very grassroots approach to what we've done. Uh, you know, we have said, how can we uh, you know, turn this out so that we can create, uh, you know, a mini cluster of sorts right here in Quincy. You know, we've seen a lot of uh, residential development. And so we wanted to see some of that activity complemented with, with, you know, creating a place that people could work, play and work, work, play and live. And, um, and that's what blockchain became for us. So, you know, we, we put together in, in 2022, a public private partnership. Uh, with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It was a $5 million project that sought to create a research and development and commercialization program. So supporting uh, blockchain founders from scratch, uh, giving them $25,000 non-dilutive uh, checks in order to prove out pilots and minimum viable products, and then running them through our growth program, having private capital available at the back end, uh, and then helping them grow up and out uh, into you know, uh, growing businesses. So you know, we, we love proving out uh, use cases. We love uh, the opportunity to uh, bake this program into people's lives. You know, this this audience is uh, no stranger understanding that to most people, uh, blockchain and digital assets is still pretty esoteric. Uh, you know, we we talk amongst ourselves and are very knowledgeable and and hope for the best in this space, uh, all of us yeah. all the time. But you know, what we saw was that people, regular people, don't understand this space, and so that's why a person like Elizabeth Warren doesn't need to really care about it because there isn't an organized enough uh, advocacy on local levels uh, to, you know, to influence a voting block. And so, you know, we have been trying to work uh, outside of uh, the people that stand in our way, deploying projects at the municipal level, working with state government and trying to prove out the value of this space in order to back into support 
uh, for those members of Congress and other legislators and, and of course, you know, just any elected leader uh, will then have to support because people have found the value that it's brought to their lives. So generally, you know, even just in the in the green room, so to speak, before this call, we were talking with with Dennis about uh, South Carolina's proliferation of, of blockchain adoption and or the lack thereof and, and the and sort of the need to build community and ecosystem down there. That's the type of approach that I'd be bringing, uh, you know, to the national stage is having a blueprint, a template and a model that we can export uh, to various areas. And it's not only just with how we've grown sort of an ecosystem and an innovation center here through Cubic, but it's project related activity. It's just completing with one of our uh, companies, the first municipal bond offering on chain in the country. Uh, you know, there are, there are thousands of municipalities across the country, all issuing uh, trillions of dollars in debt uh, through the bond markets uh, regularly. And so that is a yeah. right market for innovation, one that we love and one that will you know, continue to, to build out through. Great. Thank you. And Ian, when did you know it was time for you to run? Um, so it was the end of February. Uh, I was at an event. It was a stand with crypto event that was hosted by uh, Coinbase in Boston. And um, I, you know, I, I got hit with a lightning bolt. So, you know, I saw an opportunity essentially to build another public private partnership. You know, there was a, a, a I saw the opportunity to bring together grassroots support you know, political and business community here from Massachusetts that I'm, you know, of course, very well connected to, and then capital at the end of the day, that would make this a serious race. Great. John, similar to you, how do you think about balancing blockchain and digital, digital asset regulations with free markets? And how, how would you take your legal work in this space in case against the S SEC to the national and global markets? Well, thanks. And thanks for having us. Listen, uh, I believe that we have to uh, attack the enemy head on. And that's exactly what I did uh, when I sued the SEC on behalf of token holders. But you see, first, we got to back up and look at the problem. And the problem really is Congress. We're taking 1933's laws, uh, a, a term called investment contract in the 1933 Act. And then we're taking a 1946 Supreme Court case that dealt with orange groves. And we're trying to apply that law to modern day blockchain technology, artificial intelligence, automation, robotics. You know, that's silly. And the reason we have forced to do that is because Congress hasn't done their job. And we actually, I'm gonna tell you something that we know is a fact. Our regulators prefer it to be vague and they prefer opaqueness when it comes to regula regulation. They prefer regulation uncertainty. And I know that that's a fact because in the Ripple case, we forced the SEC, on, and I'm not saying uh, Ripple's lawyers are the ones who forced it, uh, to uncover emails between the regulators. And they literally say in there, you know, I don't think you should say that because it's gonna limit what we can say about Ethereum in the future. I don't think you should say that. We want it to be vague. We want it to be opaque. And why do they want that? They want that so that they can have maximum prosecutorial options so that they can continue to engage by regulation, by uh, enforcement. Now, Doug, you asked about how it's global. The SEC case is already global. You may or may not know this, but when I went after the SEC and sued them, and then I filed a motion to intervene, I did it on behalf of XRP holders around the world, and it went viral. 75,000 XRP holders, these are small token holders, small investors, developers, mm -hmm. Uh, people that had their money in uh, their retirement accounts frozen. 143 countries are represented in that hundred, that 75,000 XRP holders. Ukraine and Russia is at war with each other. And I had XRP holders from Ukraine and Russia, Qatar, everywhere around the world joining. And we made a difference. And, and that's not an opinion of mine. That's a fact. Judge Torres cited XRP holder affidavits, I submitted about just shy of 4,000 affidavits by XRP holders from around the world. And she cited those affidavits. And in footnote 16 of her final decision, she cited my efforts in the library case, 
where I worked as amicus counsel on behalf of Naomi Brockwell. And I did all that pro bono uh, because it was the right thing to do. And so sometimes you have to attack the problem head on. And that's what we did. And I think uh, something I'm very proud of. So, John, was it at that moment that the light bulb went off or similar to what Ian described, the lightning bolt hit you to run? No, you know what happened was uh, I saw a poll uh, that showed that former Republican governor, a Republican in Massachusetts named Charlie Baker, that he would crush her if he were running for this uh, Senate seat. It was 49 percent to 34. So I called his campaign manager and I said, listen, uh, I'll do the governor's crypto platform. I'll write his uh, crypto policy. I'm not looking for anything. I'll do it free of charge. I'll explain Bitcoin, central bank, digital currencies. And uh, the campaign manager said, John, John, the, the governor's not running. And I said, well, who's running? This was in December. And he said, no one's running. And so that's what started it. The final straw for me was if I could build the team, if I thought I could fundraise decent and, and, and win the primary, that was my three uh, decision-making points. But it was a discussion with my daughters. My five-year-old told me, go for it, daddy, right, right off the bat. But my 24-year-old and my 22-year-old, I told him, listen, your dad's thinking of running for office for the first time in his life. And girls, he's not starting off small. He's going against arguably the most entrenched Washington elite there is in D.C. And Elizabeth Warren, and they looked at me and said, Dad, you're great at everything you do, but uh, we think you're going to lose. And, you know, leave it to your kids to keep it real. And I said, girls, why, uh, why do you think Dad's going to lose? And they said, because you're too honest. And you'll never say something you don't believe in and you will never sell out, Dad. And I looked at him and I said, you just convinced me to run because that can't be the standard in this country that I served seven years of active duty in the Marine Corps for. And that's uh, the day I decided to jump in this race. Thank you. Ian, uh, moving on, switching gears, uh, the polarization of politics continues uh, for digital assets and for the most part are aligned with Republicans with many Democrats against the support of these emerging technologies and wide scale adoption. At the BBA and for most involved in this space, we believe this is a bipartisan issue. How will you reach across the aisle to find a common approach and create more urgency to establish these frameworks and laws that support responsible development and use of these products? Yeah, I think um, the there's a couple of honest points here that exist. I, I think you're giving a lot of members of Congress too much credit. I don't think as many people understand this space as you may think. I think there's a small group of people, both in the House and the Senate, that actually have any idea of what this space is about, the value that it could provide. And I think that's one part of it. Um, and so, you know, I, I would agree with you. I don't think it's a bipartisan issue. I think right now where it's seemingly um, more supported by Republicans, I think that the Republicans have found a great opportunity to take advantage of political action funds uh, in a you know highly energetic and electric presidential cycle where we've got you know two and a half months or three months left before a president's elected. Um, and because I you know there have been Democrats and I think that there are people that support us that uh, probably lean Democrat that support this space. Um, so you know I, I think generally education is still a big hurdle to get yeah. over. Uh, for people. And I think that demonstrating, as I started saying before, demonstrating these use cases, you know, we have spent a considerable amount of time with um, with organizations like yours and uh, national organizations that focus on advocacy and education in trying to build um, a repository of content that people can get in front of. Because if you want this to seriously be a voting issue, then people need to understand it. So at the end of the day, this comes down to uh, people knowing that the space exists, knowing what it is, not ne not needing to understand what blockchain is or how it operates, but just that there is something that enables them to be better, more productive members of society, or there's some value that's added to people that participate in uh, in our public uh, process. That's that's how it's gonna. That's how it's eventually going to proliferate. That's how it's going to get the support. But um, you know, we we've been focused through Cubic and building a knowledge and education platform. You know, we've had support of Castle Island Ventures and Arrington Capital and trying to yeah. you know uh, produce a repository of content that we can uh, disseminate and share. That's in a digestible and an identifiable way that people can understand what this space is really about. So yeah. you know, I think that there's you know. 
most often, again, we talk in circles. We know each other here. Like this is a small group of people where the issue has been brought to the national level. And there's a lot of uh, discussion that takes place on Twitter. But on the ground with people, this is not the issue that they're bringing up. So it's incumbent on us to either make more use cases uh, that you know uh, provide value to their lives or to continue in education. Thank you. John, the US Supreme Court just made its decision striking down the Chevron doctrine. While some may see this as a win for uh, versus the SEC, to me, it seems just to drive the continuation of the courts being the rule makers rather than lawmakers to regulators to industry. What's your impression of the current environment and what needs to change? Well, I understand your concern about it, you know, going to the courts. But let me tell you, uh, I was very quick to praise that decision. Uh, Elizabeth Warren was quick to criticize it. And it was the right decision so that people understand uh, there was a ruling that that said when there was uh vagueness, if you will, which we know the regulator likes, then the regulator can choose, interpret the law and make up rules. And there was this Chevron case that got overturned. For example, it was a fisherman who was fined $700 a day. He had to pay for someone to count how many fish that he, ca he caught per day. So he didn't go over the, uh, the limit. And the Supreme Court said, no, uh, Congress must specifically authorize our federal agencies to do what they're doing. Now, the perfect example of why the Chevron decision was the right decision lies with my opponent, Elizabeth Warren. And everyone in this community probably knows this, but Senator Warren sits on the banking committee, which oversees the SEC, Securities Exchange Commission. And before a hearing, when Gary Gensler, the chairman, was sworn under oath, her office sent him not only the questions that she was going to ask beforehand, she sent him the suggested answers to those questions. She then read the script that she wrote. He provided the answers she told him to say. And then she got on TV and said, look what Gary Gensler said. Don't take my word for it. Look what the expert Gary Gensler said. She violated her oath, and that's an example of what you call regulatory capture by a senator. She has captured the agency, and he's doing, uh, he being Gary Gensler's doing Senator Warren's bidding. And so that's why, in a perfect example of why Chevron was the right decision. Now, how we can change it, because I think your concern, Doug, is an accurate one. Now, what we're going to have in the court, and I've been a trial lawyer for almost three decades, and what it's going to end up happening is a battle of experts in the court. And whoever can hire the most experts, you know, they're going to argue before the judge, you know, this is how it should go. But I support term limits for senators and Congress people. You get 12 years and then you're out. I also support one of my first bills is going to be a statutory bar that prevents a regulator from working in the industry that they were just regulating for three to five years. In other words, when you're the chairman of the FDA on Friday and you resign, you don't get to go be on the board of Pfizer come Monday morning. When you're the yeah. SEC chair like Gary Gensler or Jay Clayton, I don't care Republican or Democrat, doesn't matter to me, you don't get to then go regulate the companies, work for the companies you were just regulating. And when we have that kind of clean system, then maybe we could go back to sort of giving a little more deference to regulators. Okay. Thank you, John. You're welcome. We, we, we have some momentum and we were talking about this before the session started. Uh, this week, we had seven asset managers launch an ETH spot ETF. The FIT21 bill recently passed the House and is sitting with the Senate. The SAB 121 bill to overturn the SEC's guidance for public banks was vetoed by the president after passing the House and Senate. The stablecoin bill spent, sponsored by Senator Lummis and Senator Gillibrand currently sits to be brought to the Senate. You know, my question to both of you, uh, is this enough to drive change and will these bills get through? What else should happen to lead to greater, greater clarity? And Ian, you mentioned the kind of general unwillingness of lawmakers to get involved in this space uh, up to this date. 
you know, Ian, how would you navigate and lead through this current logjam? So I don't think it's an unwillingness. I think it's, I don't think they know enough, right? I just don't think they're, they're, yeah, they don't think they get it. And I think, um, I I think it's their urgency, sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's the, we need a sense of urgency, right? Well, it's our urgency. It's, it, this is, you know what I mean? Again, like I, I always like to separate between this being an important issue for us and everyone here on this call and yeah. uh, the difference between that and legislative priorities that members of Congress hold for whatever various purposes because their constituency most likely drives them or whatever their interests are, you know, who supports them in Congress. So, yeah. you know, I think even going back to your prior question, you know, I, I've thought about this as, as turf warfare for a long time because, you know, you're going back to the genesis of, of the most prominent use case being Bitcoin and and sort of the political philosophy around it, which was much more libertarian and freedom loving. Right. And this was about being able to transact and exchange, uh, you know, on a, on a more free basis without intermediaries, no banks in the way, et cetera. Right. Um, and people want their share. So what you're seeing, a person like Elizabeth Warren, uh, she's trying to get the government's share. And then the central banks want control of the whole thing, right? And the banks don't want to be cut out. And then, of course, like depending on how smart contracts evolve, uh, lawyers probably won't want to be uh, cut out of the equation as well. But, you know, it, there, are, there are, I think at the end of the day, you know, when you look at this, there's going to end up being um, a, a healthy mix of groups involved. You know, while everyone has their chosen methodology for how this is going to win out, um, you know, that's why these pieces of legislation are important because, of course, the Fit 21 stablecoin, this is the industry saying, hey, listen, we're not trying to subvert laws here. We're not trying to be criminals. We are not criminals. We are trying to have regulatory and market clarity here so that we can operate appropriately and efficiently uh, in collaboration with the government. Right. Just give us give us a, give us a clean signal here. So, yep. you know, how do you move these things forward? I mean, uh, to be honest with you, what, what, whether it is John or myself, uh, we would most likely be the most knowledgeable members of Congress in this space. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind about that. Even, you know, uh, S- Senator Lummis, who has been, uh, you know, she's a supporter of this campaign. She has been out front. She just uh, announced a couple of great uh, things related, uh, programs related to Bitcoin uh, this yeah. week. Um, you know, I, I think that we come with uh, practical application and experience in the space that we're bringing, you know, and so it's much different than anyone else who's in Congress uh, right now. So I think that, you know, the ability to, again, it's it's educating other members of Congress, understanding that this is a priority, but then it's also using uh, groups like yours and the other political interest groups uh, yeah. to to, sh- to show that influence too, because, you know, it's, it's also, it's often discussed that this is a voting block. And yes, on a nationwide basis, there are plenty of people who are interested in this, but on an organized basis where the votes come from on local levels, uh, I, it's not there yet, you know? So again, it's education and it's coalition building. Thank you, Ian. John, had, had, same question. How do you see the path forward and how would you lead and support uh, these efforts? Sure, thanks. Uh, well, listen, Ian's right about the education. Um, and, you know, we have to just get off Twitter and we, and the, the small circle that Ian was talking about that's part of this group. You know, there's a saying in crypto, we're still early and we're early. Uh, when I've testified at you know, I testified at a New Hampshire state legislature hearing. It was a Zoom hearing. And the, the questions that you get from people who are not part of this industry, and these are state legislatures, right? Uh, state Senate or uh, state house. There are questions that we look back were questions in 2013. For example, for example, I was asked by a, a state legislature, an educated person, John, isn't uh, isn't Bitcoin really used by criminals and the drug cartels? Now, everyone on this call and viewing knows that that that's the narrative that Senator Warren has pushed, and that the reality is significantly less than one percent of Bitcoin and crypto is used for illicit uh, criminal activity. In fact, Hamas leadership issued a directive, don't use crypto because it was too traceable. And so we have to control the narrative, which is part of the education uh, that I think Ian was talking about. And but look, there is there's a big difference this year versus two years. Like I said, I've been fighting for five years for smart, tailored legislation 
uh, I've always felt that regulatory clarity was the number one thing holding back this industry. But we have to control the narrative. Everyone on this call knows that exit ramps and on ramps like Coinbase or Kraken, they do all kinds of KYC and AML. You know, yeah. my campaign uh, uses Coinbase Commerce to accept crypto. And I have a Coinbase, I'm a Coinbase customer, and it took two days for them to vet me. And I'm already a customer because they were complying with so much of their AML KYC. And so the good news, though, is if you look at Fit 21, it oh, it passed overwhelmingly yeah. in the House. And if don't hold me to it, but I think it was 71 Democrats that also joined uh, to pass that legislation. And yep. we all can agree. I, I know, Ian, I, maybe one of the only times to let me speak for him, right, is that we both are going to agree that this technology in industry should not be partisan. Right, hundred percent. It's it should. It's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democrat issue. You know, it's an innovation issue. And so, uh, the good news is, I think we're making progress. We took a hit with FTX, yeah. obviously, and Sam Bankman Freed, and all of that. But um, I, I think the the future's bright. To be honest with you, and I'm, I've never been more optimistic about this uh, industry uh, and technology than I am today. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, as, as a segue, as I mentioned, we invited uh, Senator Warren to a to a similar session. Her team said she was unavailable. That that invitation to her remains open. Um, but to share with you all, the BBA is set out to build a community of the people and firms that want to build and scale their products in the right uh, in the right and compliant way. The majority of these people and firms have businesses in Massachusetts. We've had a thousand institutional people. Uh, join us for seven events in 23 and 24. How would you both engage our community to take an inclusive and collaborative approach toward common and understood standards? John, I'll start with you. Well, you know, I start with that optimism. In 2017 and 2018, I would have been much more negative because even within the crypto industry, you had a lot of tribalism. You know, to, get, to give you an example, Doug, um, uh, and today I just declared this in my financial statements, but when I sued the SEC, a lot of the Bitcoin community called me, you know, the XRP attorney, they called me a, the shitcoin attorney and all of those type of things. And I was ridiculed when in fact, 80% of my net worth is in Bitcoin. Uh, and so that's how it was labeled. And we were saying, listen, this is about government overreach. And we saw... We saw that play out because then we saw the SEC uh, get found arbitrary and capricious over the Bitcoin spot ETF. And so the first thing we have to acknowledge is how far we've come as an industry. I mean, you're going to have Bitcoin and crypto discussed during the presidential debates. You have two out of the three leading presidential candidates who are talking about very positive statements related to Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. Um, and so I think that what we have to do is what Ian said earlier, which is we've, we've got to begin with the education and educating the rest of the world uh, and, and America. We have one out of five people in America, adults own crypto today. That's only going to increase, but it's not a tabletop issue that people are talking about. You know, I'm sure Ian hears the same thing. You know, when we're out there talking to the voters, I'm not hearing much. I hear it once in a while because of, of uh, what I did in the XRP case, but we're not hearing crypto talked a lot about. It's more obviously inflation, housing, cost of living, immigration, mm -hmm. things of that nature. So we, we have to really focus on educating the public, the benefits of this technology. Thank you. And similar question to you. you, you are neck deep in this community. Uh, we know that, but, but how do you stay engaged in this community as you lead the creation of these frameworks and, and a more collaborative approach? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm already here. You know, I've been engaged. I, as I said, I got, I got my start with uh, folks from the BBA and uh, you know, our involvement in blockchain wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be there without it. And, you know, we have, 
diversified our community and ecosystem building over the years. So if it's not the R&D and commercialization program directly supporting founders, um, you know, we, we of course now host Boston Blockchain Week, which we took over in 2022. Uh, we're hosting uh, Boston Blockchain Week, by the way, September 10th through the 13th here in Quincy. So please mark your calendars. Uh, if you want to participate, we'd love to have you. Uh, and that's another way that we that we engage your community, especially from the institutional level. We have you know multiple levels of partnerships between our core growth program, uh, our community and ecosystem around Boston blockchain, uh, and we work with the government too. So we tie all these pieces together, and we've been successful in creating this mini cluster that we originally sought uh, to build from the get go. Um, you know, but generally. We're, we're always open to having more uh, discussions about the space and trying to figure out what type of projects we can build, how we how we can be more collaborative. And uh, that's obviously through events like this. It's uh, in-person events and, yeah. you know, ha happy to come up with any new uh, medium with which you think would be the most appropriate to engage your, your large and important community here. But um, this is the most important part. This is the stuff, as you very well know, that Elizabeth Warren doesn't do. You said from the from the outset that she won't even engage here. You know why? Because she, from the start of her campaign uh, last year said, I'm building an anti-crypto army. And you know very well that there is no such thing and there's nobody that is out there uh, saying that I'm a part of an anti-crypto army because that doesn't make sense and there's no reason to do that. Unless they're yeah. bankers, right? Unless they're they're bankers saying, you know, we, we're we part of this. So, um, you know, it, that's what I hear generally across the board with a person like Elizabeth Warren is that she's not willing to engage. She doesn't want to be part uh, of community discussions. She'd rather be part of uh, photo ops uh, in order to keep her celebrity status uh, in this position. So, you know, they, they, these are easy wins. This is stuff that you learn at the grassroots level of politics uh, and in community building is that if you're not sitting and understanding what people uh, want, your constituency wants or needs or the thoughts, then you're not doing the job. Thank you, Ian. So our, our focus at the BBA and obviously this this conversation tonight has been on blockchain and digital assets and the responsible adoption of these emerging technologies. But uh, what other policies will you both prioritize? Um, I'm sorry that we didn't have more time to go down this specific question, but Ian, I'll kick off with you. Sure. So um, the number one issue that I that where it's like consuming everyone in Massachusetts, and it is a also a nonpartisan issue is illegal immigration. Uh, Massachusetts has absorbed an undue uh, physical and financial burden over the last two years now. And um, so, you know, we just released, I think it was last week, a seven point plan on how we would, uh, what we would focus on when we get to the US Senate around some of the issues around illegal immigration, which has been a bipartisan failure at the federal level, uh, right? And then it has stemmed to the state's uh, own issues. But we would look to, um, make sure that states across the country wouldn't be able to designate themselves as sanctuary states or cities, uh, make sure that we are looking into uh, the abuse of the asylum program uh, and make sure that we're catching up on, uh, you know, the backlog of the processes that, you know, we've got 80,000 people over at IRS, but nobody being deployed over into uh, immigration so that we can fix this problem. That seems like a very easy switch because all we're doing is targeting uh, middle class people in the IRS and giving them uh, audits. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a clear opportunity to, uh, you know, to beef up, beef up the team for areas that really require attention and that people in this country want to see improvements to. Uh, but outside of that, you know, there's general sort of economic issues, the pocketbook issues. People are, people are struggling. Uh, you know, they, uh, uh, they're seeing insurance for both their homes and their, and their cars rise. They're seeing, they're not being able to afford cost of living generally, right? Going to the supermarket is now um, a more expensive affair than it once was a couple of years ago. And so, you know, people are looking for solutions to that. So it's trying to figure out what are, uh, you know, economic, uh, you know, what, what are some fiscal policies that can, that can change, uh, you know, that situation, but also what are alternative pathways to prosperity, especially starting with our young people. Uh, you know, we have been commonly uh, guiding all of our young people towards college and university, financing their life away at 18 years old in order to yeah. only sort of continue to, to start, uh, in, you know, to, uh, to sort of false start the next place in their life, right? So they can't afford a house after they finance the college, the yeah. budget line item is too much. 
And so, you know, we need to be opening up areas like this to short term training programs. And it's not just blockchain, it's other parts of tech and their technical and non technical roles within this entire ecosystem, but also trade. You know, there are there are open uh, jobs out there for people that could be fulfilled with short term training. And that's something that we have to focus on, too. Are you there, Doug? Did you freeze? I think you froze, Doug. He was just so compelled by that response. <laughs> OK, well, I, I think he was going to probably ask me the same thing. So I'll uh, Dennis, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in. Um, and so, listen, a lot of people out there might be surprised to hear candidates for U.S. Senate in Massachusetts talking about immigration. And what a lot of people don't know outside of Massachusetts is that here in the Commonwealth, we have a right to shelter law for anyone who's homeless. It does not require residency or anything like that. In 1983, the legislature and the governor signed into law. If you're a homeless person, uh, the government will pay for you. And so, as you can imagine, they did not envision a completely open southern border. And it got so bad that they were in Logan Airport sleeping. They commandeered a rec center meant for poor kids in Roxbury, where I lived my first year of law school. And when they did that, I told my campaign, I want to go to the border. I, want, I know the problem here. I want to see the root of it. And what I learned at the border is shocking. There, uh, there's bus stops along the border where the migrants come. They don't even run. They wait to be picked up by Border Patrol. Then they're transported to a facility with no documents. You don't know if their name is correct. You don't have any identification. You don't even know if the, where they're telling you from is truthful. And they're given a court date, an asylum court date of 2032 was the dates being given out when I was at the border. So uh, it is by far right now, it's impacting our infrastructure. It's impacting our schools, uh, urgent care. And then aside from that, we've got to get this debt issue under control. Almost five, almost 50 percent of people don't have five hundred dollars set aside in case of an emergency. The government's 34 trillion in debt. We pay more on our interest on our debt alone than we pay for national defense. Uh, Massachusetts is now the single most expensive state to live in for a family of four, a working family. And so we've got to adopt policies. You can't tax your way out of it. That can't happen. Uh, and you can't certainly spend your way out of it. So, you know, when you when you learn that 80 percent of all U.S. dollars in circulation today have been printed in the last several years. If that doesn't scream that we're about to go over a cliff, I don't know what does. And so that's where I would focus. Apologies. I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. Uh, it'll, yeah, it'll apologies, everyone. I, my internet, of course, kicked out on me at the worst time. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you both. We're just in the interest of time. We're gonna we're gonna cut over to the the Q and A. Uh, the first question is from Dennis. Uh, in a word, what does liberty in tech mean to you? Please provide an example or brief explanation of how digital assets and blockchain might expand the concept of liberty in our society. Ian, I'll start with you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, heart, I spoke about that a little bit and talking about the original uh, blockchain use case around Bitcoin. I think that was largely around freedom and liberty and it was freedom to transact. Um, Actually, before we got on this today, I was I was thinking about that concept because I think, um, you know, most people think of money as this um, object and, you know, you use it to do things uh, and it takes you places. But I don't think people think of it uh, so much as energy and expression. Right. And, you know, using money fundamentally is uh, is freedom of expression. And so, you know, if there are. Uh, barriers being put in place to new methods, technologies, and innovations, uh, you know, that are trying to enable how we enact commerce, right, whether on a peer-to-peer -peer basis or through commercial activity, then there's something we need to do about that. And, and I think that's probably why um, you would see more Republican values aligning with uh, this this concept of of free freedom money or you know Bitcoin or other types of cryptocurrencies for exchange um, because I think that you know the the 
the Democrats, uh, you know, which, you know, they might have different, there's different ideas that I hear come from that side. And I, we didn't talk much about it, but the C CBDC, I think would more likely come from, especially a person like Elizabeth Warren, who's supportive of such a concept. And, and that yeah. in my mind is the antithesis of freedom. That is not, uh, you know, that is a control mechanism, uh, a digital control mechanism that would be administered by the government. And so, you know, um, that's my example. Hope, hope that was good for you, Dennis. Thank you, Ian. Um, just in the interest of the questions, John, we're going to we're going to move on from Kelly. The candidate that wins on September 3rd needs to beat Elizabeth Warren on November 5th. That goes beyond crypto and digital asset issues. What will each of you do to actually stand up and beat her going beyond crypto? Massachusetts has a lot of issues. Yeah, listen, uh, I wouldn't be in this race if I didn't uh, think I could honestly win it. Uh, and I was so convinced I could win. I put a million dollars of my own money in this race to build the infrastructure necessary. Uh, we have uh, hundreds of volunteers that are giving up their time. Um, the first quarter we outraised Elizabeth Warren. Um, and so when you look at Elizabeth Warren, it's prosecuting her record. Right. I'm not going personal. I'm not going to call names or anything like that. I'm just going to show the, the voters that in 12 years as primary sponsor, she has only passed one bill. If anyone else in Massachusetts had that lack of productivity at work, they would be fired. So I'm asking the voters to fire her as their U.S. senator. And prosecuting the fact that she's the epitome of what happens in Washington, D.C. You know, 12 years ago, she promised that she would hold the bankers accountable and she promised to go to D.C. And, and make them accountable. Well, you fast forward a decade later and those same bankers write her bills now. She's the epitome of what happens. She couldn't beat them, so she joined them. She went from holding them accountable to their number one lobbyist today. And I think mm -hmm. with the voters, the one thing I know they're tired of the most is the division, the politics of destruction, the politics of division. They want someone who wants to uplift people, not tear people down. And my message is about uplifting people. The last thing I'll say about it is she's great fighting against things. For example, she's great at fighting against the rich and the wealthy. That is not the same as fighting for the poor and for the middle class. And I want to uplift those because I used to be one of those poor kids who, who didn't have enough food to eat at night. And so I want to show them how I accomplished it in my personal life. I'm going to want to modify or abolish the accredited investor rule that excludes 92% of the American population from appreciable assets. And so it's going to be an uplifting message that wins, I believe. Thank you, John. Ian, going to the next from George. Any comment on the movement towards tokenization of real world assets such as bonds, treasuries, et cetera? Do you support this movement? Yeah, not only do I support it, but I've had one of my companies from Cubic, uh, as I said earlier in the initial narrative, that we launched uh, the first municipal bond offering on blockchain in the country. Uh, that's a huge project. Great, great demonstration of a real world asset. Uh, you know, so we, you know, we like those things. There's another project that we have been advancing also. So you've seen plenty of uh, the market approach uh, use cases for real estate. And, you know, right now, uh, it doesn't work back to the, to the source of truth, which would be at the government, which would be through the deed. And, um, so we've been advancing a project with a registry of deeds in Massachusetts in order to uh, replicate, of course, like the, the reporting mechanism throughout the department, but then, uh, enabling us to work back to the market to facilitate transactions. So we're working on a proof of concept around that. Um, and that's why, you know, I, I love having the uh, knowledge and wherewithal to navigate not only uh, local yep. government, but county government and state government, because I know how to get these things done. You know, it's that experience that I'm bringing to the U.S. Senate that is invaluable. I understand that these things don't happen overnight. You need to build, really build and have relationships and you need to be able to sell into these places. And it's just a long it's a long sales cycle. Um, so, you know, in sum. Uh, I am certainly for, uh, you know, these tokenization of real world assets and love trying to figure out uh, how to get more demonstrated. And you see you see in the larger institutional level uh, that these firms are going that way. I mean, you've got uh, institutions in town alone, Fidelities, the, you know, and the likes who, who have been looking at this for a long time. Uh, so, you know, we're in lockstep with them. 
and it's certainly we've seen in all of our institutional events that we've done at the BBA, there's a whole lot more innovation going on that's that's being publicly uh, advertised for fear of retribution by the regulators. So yes. yep. um, a lot of it's being done under the radar at the moment just because they just don't want the scrutiny. Um, John from Sam, how will you support the use of blockchain technology to enhance regulation and transparency in the banking system, aiming to prevent failures like Silicon Valley Bank? Well, listen, I think that once you put uh, the one thing that lacks more than anything in the banking industry comes down to one word, transparency. And that's the one thing that the blockchain brings for sure is transparency, where you can actually see on chain every single transaction. You know, just think about this. We have United States government that. Uh, a person called Caitlin Long, who is the founder of Custodial Bank in Wyoming, had a revolutionary idea. And that is instead of fractional banking, where the bank holds maybe 10 percent of the deposit it takes, you're actually going to have 100 percent reserves so that if there ever was any kind of bank run, Everyone would have all of their assets. If you had $10,000 in the bank and you wanted your $10,000 on Monday, you could get it. If you had Bitcoin, you could get it. And so she has been in litigation being persecuted by Elizabeth Warren and the banking industry because they don't want that concept to enter our fractional banking system. And by putting everything, uh, forcing those types of innovation and then putting everything on chain where you could actually see every transaction, there goes your uh, your transparency. But uh, I think we're far, far away from that because these bankers are gonna fight like hell before they ever have to provide the American public that level of transparency. Thank you. Ian, from Justin, do you support the recent push to ban stock trading for politicians while in an elected position? Would you support a similar ban on crypto trading for politicians as well? Yeah, so I think um, in theory, I would generally support this. Um, you know, I, I watch with uh, much, I guess, entertainment, the Pelosi stock tracker, which I think is uh, yeah. comical, but also a very serious thing, right? You've got members right. of Congress who are trading on inside information. Uh, and it's very apparent, um, you know, I think that if there's, you know, and, and this is this is a, such a great place for a blockchain application within government. It is, you know, yeah. I guess sort of linking the ability to understand what's coming down the pike from a legislative perspective and then seeing how uh, trades are enacted through crypto. So, you know, I think um, most of it, if there's if if legislators are uh, moving uh, laws that would somehow benefit them, then I certainly stand for banning their ability to profit off those decisions that they're making. Thank you. John, uh, from Karen, what are your plans to incentivize blockchain technology in Massachusetts and how will you make Boston a hub? Well, you know, th here's the thing that people ask me. They ask me, John, are you the pro, are you pro crypto? And what I say to them is no, I'm pro freedom and I'm pro free markets and free enterprise. And I have to tell you, it's not just related to crypto, but the entire regulatory environment in Massachusetts has to change. I give you an example, and this is what Senator Warren, she supports the accredited investor rule, which excludes people from private equity. In 1980, when Apple stock went uh, IPO, the state securities here in Massachusetts prevented any Massachusetts resident who wasn't an accredited investor, in other words, rich guy or gal from owning Apple stock because it was too risky. All right. We have a housing crisis in Massachusetts right now, yet it's taking two, three years for developers to get the permits required. And so whether it's blockchain or whether it's commercial real estate or residential, I plan to bring a, we have to lower the regulations. We're over-regulating industry, eliminate the red tape. When the federal government is the number one growing economy in, in America, that's a problem. And so it's just going to be an all around um, fostering of innovation. And let me tell you something, when innovation and technology is facilitated and fostered in this country, Massachusetts wins. 
because we're the leader in innovation and technology. Thank you, John. Well, can I add to that? Yeah, please. Yeah, please. So, um, you know, I think that generally Boston, Boston is a hub uh, for blockchain tech already. Uh, we've got so much going on here. It's it, we are just not totally coalesced. It, it operates sometimes in silos. You've got so much going on at MIT. You've got stuff, you know, between the clubs at all the colleges and universities around town. You've got Fidelity, again, who have been leading in this space for probably about a decade. You got State Street, who's just waiting, uh, you know, so that they can, uh, you know, we can repeal SAB 121 and they can custody, you know. So there is so much. And then, of course, like the lower level and the, and the whole kind of uh, group of ecosystem here. So, you know, just for a small example, Massachusetts Technology Collaborative have already started this. They gave us a $2 million grant in 2022 to incentivize the development of blockchain tech. And so our intention, just from Cubic and from Quincy, our next generation plan for growth here is to build on that successful project. You know, we've already seen from that $2 million uh, state program, uh, we've seen orders of magnitude and investment that has come into those companies that have benefited from a $25,000 non-dilutive uh, grant to prove out a concept. So, you know, how we're looking at, um, you know, incentive is, is being able to write larger checks with larger partnerships uh, akin to the one that we've already developed. But again, Boston is already a hub. It's just, we're, we play the long game here. And so, you know, while people had moved down to Miami and it, you actually don't hear too much about uh, their space uh, anymore, you know, we're going to eclipse them because we've got all the large institutions who are ready to, uh, you know, unleash all of the projects that they've been developing in partnership with groups like ours. Thank you both. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, to, to, to wrap up the, the night, we're, um, we're getting close to the end here. Closing, closing question for both of you. Uh, I'll start with John. At the end of your first six year term, what will you look to have accomplished? And what will you look to be measured on by the voters during that six year period? By my uh, record and my results, uh, my first bill will be for term limits. And if it, that's gonna be a tough sell because these, uh, these people uh, who make their money after they go to Washington, as opposed to me who made my money before going to Washington, uh, they're gonna fight it. But I will tell you this, if I'm unsuccessful, I've already went on record, I will not run for a third term. Uh, under any circumstance, because I believe that you do have to compromise. What my daughters talked about, daddy, you'll never sell out. Daddy, you, you, you won't compromise your values. If you're going to be a career politician like Senator Warren, you're going to have to do that. And I don't mean compromise in the good way. I mean, compromising who you are as a person and your values. Yeah. And I think that you have to. And so uh, it'll be term limits. I think I'm going to be a huge a fighter for women's rights uh, in a way that they haven't witnessed before. I'm a father of three daughters. Um, and so judge me on my record, not my words. Let me tell you, pay attention to what people did when no one was watching. When no one knew John Deaton's name, John Deaton was fighting the United States government pro bono on the behalf of this industry in multiple cases, Coinbase case, the Ripple case, the library case. And I did it because it was the right thing to do. So I encourage people, pay attention to actions, not words. If they do that, I'll be very successful. John, what's the last line in your book? No fear, never give up. Thank you. Ian, same question to you. At the end of your yeah. first term, what are you looking to, to accomplish and what are you looking to be evaluated by the voters? So there's, um... I think there's some sort of theoretical concepts that I that I think are very important that uh, Elizabeth Warren certainly hasn't delivered on and that she she certainly doesn't defend. And I think that's around the fundamentals of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And so, you know, that is certainly the areas with which, you know, I will hope to be measured on is, you know, I, I very much view this role in the United States Senate as one um, to enable and empower people's lives as opposed to make them more dependent on uh, government, right? And, you know, there's an opportunity to, you know, not only address uh, economic issues, which would benefit families, hardworking families who, you know, have been uh, left in the lurch by fast growing uh, innovation in this country, catch them up through education and job opportunity around economic growth and development. But again, this number one issue 
around illegal immigration is something that needs tending and it needs attention. And so, you know, one of the first bills that I would uh, put forward is around the seven point plan that I discussed earlier, which I'm, I'm happy to send around and, and share with your audience, uh, because that is what people are actively talking about, actively engaged in, witnessing it right before our very eyes. So and that's that's part of that's part of living and that is part of safety. That's public safety. That is making sure that we are uh, honoring our borders and we actually have a country uh, that we are defending and upholding uh, the rights and rules of the land. And so, you know, I want to be measured on on those things. I want to be measured on the aspects of enabling and empowering uh, people in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and making sure that their safety uh, is protected at the end of the day and so that they can live uh, free and clear lives. Thank you. John and Ian, thank you both. So appreciate your time. Uh, we will, we encourage everyone on this call to please donate to either Ian or John's campaign or both. I think we would all be very well represented by Ian or John, uh, and we look forward to continuing to collaborate and build up the community. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Dennis. Well, thank you both. Thanks, uh, I just want to add that I think we've set a standard here uh, for a level of knowledge that needs to be brought into Congress by our political candidates, and I want to applaud you both for you know, for taking the time. Obviously, if, was, if I was voting in Massachusetts, I'd very, have a very difficult decision to make right now but between the two of you, not the opponent. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Take Thank care. You. Everybody Thank take you. care.